explanation, uh, the agility they call it, and also the, the reaction uh, uh, time. My name is Glenn Koldenhoff, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, I'm riding for Monster Energy, Yamaha, Factory, MEGP. Glenn Koldenhoff's a really interesting rider. We've watched him over the years beat the very, very best riders out there in the world. He's proved it on two occasions now, at two of the biggest events, the Olympics of motocross. Watching Glenn uh, at Redbud, the track was you know, really, really hard. Um, it rained for, for two days non-stop. You could hardly even walk around the, the, the pit area, let alone what it was like to actually be on a track. And we watched him dismiss every other rider out there, including some of his fiercest rivals like Jeffrey Hurlins. Final lap. Wow, what That's a statement. How confident huh? he is. What a statement. Great ride for the Rebel KTM rider out of, out of the Netherlands. And he's got a massive round of applause as well. And uh, that is a personal achievement. Race one with a win. He was uh, so ecstatic with that. But to go 1 1, just like Anstey last year. Fast forward 12 months, and Glenn done exactly the same thing again. He beat the best in the world. There's no reason why he can't do the same thing this year to win the World Championship. But what a moment, what an experience. And it'll be a big moment as well because Kolonov comes out of the final turn. He goes 1-1 again, this time on home soil. The Netherlands win for the first time. Yeah, definitely, you know, it was highlight last year already in Redbird, but now this time double gold, you know, doing it with Team The Netherlands um, in front of our king is, is something special. and. Um, the crowd was amazing today. Every single lap I came by the, the grandstands, I heard them. And uh, it's been an amazing weekend and something we, we will never forget, that's for sure. Anyone who knows of Glenn Koldenhoff and has followed his career thinks of him as a KTM rider. He was on one in MX2. He was on one for the overwhelming majority of his MXGP career, save one season on a Suzuki. So for him to suddenly appear on a Japanese bike, a Yamaha, is really going to take some getting used to and it's a big commitment from his side because he had everything he needed at KTM or gas gas towards the end. You know I've been five years with the other brand and um, to change to, to a new brand is always a, a bit difficult I would say in the beginning but um, I think factory bikes in, in general they are all not that bad and um, it's just uh, I need to get used to the, the handling of the bike and it reacts different in, in different places. And um, yeah, I felt like we, we had two months now and I'm pretty much used to, to the bike and yeah, we are just uh, finalizing things, you know, to, to make the bike even more built for myself. And um, this is going on a good way, so I'm happy so far. Glenn is a kind of, uh, of course, sand rider. Uh, due to the fact that he's a, he's a Dutch rider, but uh, he got some skills that are not common. I never understood uh, how it's possible that he, he never put everything in the same season, you know, together, because uh, he has some of the best end of the season ever, I guess, uh, with victories and with incredible races as a GP of the nations, like he did in Red Bud in America. Uh, when conditions are really tricky and demanding and physical, it's, it's, it's really a good, good rider. It's a strange one with Glenn because people think of his last two, three years and they think of his GP wins, they think of his podiums, they think of his Motocross of Nations success. But, and whilst you would naturally think of those highs, there have also been some incredibly difficult moments. He's had two back injuries in two years. He's lost feeling in his lower body. He knows what it's like to flirt with that dangerous edge. So for him to even be in a position now where he wants to race, let alone still going for a world title, is commendable. But it's this quality that any rider in this field has. Everyone knows of the consequences. Everyone knows what could happen. But the love of the sport and the desire to be the best eventually trumps all of that. 
Uh, the conditions are taking a turn for the worst. If ever you needed to start, Jason Thomas, today was the day. Yeah, it's so cliche to say, but in a condition like this, where you're not going to be able to see well, you're not going to be able to move around the track very well, you need to get out front so you can control your own destiny. You know, the traction was almost at a, at a peak going into the second moto. We'll get some downpour. It's really going to change the approach. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some last-minute tire changes. MXGP race two. Wow, oh, this one's going to be a good one. Hurling's very tentative, dropping off the mesh there on the on the wet metal, but around the outside, oh, riders going wide in the first turn, and it is a Yamaha. It's cold enough in those orange boots, white and orange boots, is it? Yes, it is. So cold enough pulls the Fox hole shot. Where's Vebra? Your winner from race one. Glenn Coldenoff, been a, a decent ride for him. He's going to get his first podium for Montreal. It's Yamaha. He would have liked the race win, I'm sure. He would have loved to have stood on the top step of the podium even more. But you know what? Take it while you can. It's a good improvement for Glenn Coldenoff. 17th overall at the first round, 8th overall a week ago at Matsley Basin. He's going to be second overall today. Talk about making uh, gains. Well, we're about three months ahead of schedule on Glenn Coldenoff's results here. So, My first podium together with Yamaha, a new team and everything, you know. It's been amazing, and um, yeah, my season just started now. I think the passion, the passion for the sport, you know, um, it's just, it's what I love. This is my life, and I think it will, it will stay forever. And, um, you know, uh, every day trying to improve to be better. Every single year, every single week, every single day, you know, putting, putting the maximum effort and uh, try to become the best one day. So uh, that's, that's always been the goal and it will always be like this. Glenn Coldenoff, Montreal's Yamaha, born down the road, pleased that there's a home GP here at Oss, his home circuit. He looked good in time practice as well. I think I'm pretty good at uh, focusing at myself, you know, and uh, you need to stay re realistic. And um, I've been close in 2019, I was third in the championship. And uh, obviously last year, you know, I had an injury, but I feel like I'm a guy which, which still improves every, every year a little bit and um, I feel like I'm a quite consistent top five guy but uh, I need to step it up to consistent top three. And it surprised me, honestly it surprised me a lot, he's doing pretty well. He got also some bad luck with the crash like in the second moto in uh, Oz uh, that took him away from a possibility to fight for a podium uh, and maybe also for a victory. 110 metres or thereabouts into turn one. Clean through there in the first race and at the bottom of turn two. And once again, it's Febra, but around the outside, Jorge Prado, rider down at the back and riders down. Oh, end over end, different riders going over the bars. He's won GPs from time to time. He's won motos from time to time. But to reach that next level and be there consistently is a whole different ball game. Maybe sounds like a small step, but it's in the end, you know, it's, it's quite a step. But I feel like I've all the things around me which, uh, which can make me uh, to do this step. And uh, I'm confident, uh, I'm putting every, everything in it and um, yeah, hopefully it will come out one day. The MX2 class is where some of the most promising riders in the world learn how to put all of the pieces of the puzzle together. These riders have speed, they have ability, they have the potential. But putting all of those things together to form the perfect combination is a struggle. The MX2 class is where they learn how to do that. Look at Conrad Muse. He was a junior world champion. He won races in EMX125, he won races in EMX250. He's got the speed. Everyone knows he can win. It's just putting things together on race day that appears to be the struggle for him. Everyone knows how good he can be. It's just whether he will eventually hit that level. I mean, there isn't much for me to tell him if he's firing on all cylinders, you know, regarding the ride inside, um, apart from some lines or, you know, small things. But when he's riding at his best, which is, is a lot of the time, um, and it happens a lot in the week, and, you know, he, he, he's one of the fastest in the world. I don't think anyone would, would disagree with that. But it's the next bit, you know, that needs to happen on a Sunday. Um, and last year we had, you know, glimmers of, you know, the Conrad that everybody knows and he knows and I know and the team knows came to, came to race. Well, he's definitely not going to let Muse through, but then uh, Muse tries to get alongside the factory KTM. 
just trying to get himself reorganised. And Muse goes around the outside but runs out of real estate. So it's trying to bring that out in him every time. And he's quite openly honest that, you know, sometimes he struggles and sometimes he doesn't. But we need to eliminate those days that he does struggle and um, sometimes there's not an explanation for it. So you have to, you know, manage it, keep the morale up, keep the confidence up, keep the hard work up, you know, and, and yeah. I, you know, in this game, it, results give you the confidence. Results breed more good results. And yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes in the morning you can tell when he comes in, you can tell it's going to be a good day because he's kind of got like his heads up. He's got a little bit of swagger, and you can just tell, yep, today's going to be a good day. We've had we've had a few of those days. Like Spain last year was one that just the, the mood was easy, and you could just tell. And then other days you can sort of tell it's not going to happen. Like yeah, you know, as soon as I got here um, on Friday, I looked at the track, and straight away I knew that I was going to feel comfortable around here. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing track, it's um, yeah, a lovely venue and I'm, I'm just feeling really good. Um, this has been a build up now for a few weeks, so I'm over the moon to get my first um, hold qualifying. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to the races. It's gonna be uh, nice to be the first bike out for sight and lap. It's, been the, it's obviously the first time in my career. So yeah, I'm looking forward to hopefully having two good starts and two solid races. Yeah, I mean, it, it varies from week to week, day to day sometimes, um, and you get a feel in the morning, how he's been, what's going on with the track. Um, are we at a deep sand track? What, what you know, has he had good results here before? Um, what was he doing the week before? But lately, it's just been trying to get the confidence into him to, um, yeah, to get him to realise how good he is. Yeah, it's my home race for me and the track's awesome. And um, I felt good in qualifying. It's all very close up there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to get out there and, um, and put on a show for the fans. Oh, all, all good? Yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. They blocked two off, so you were that green one there. Hey. Looks like you were that green gate. Where? One, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. Are they going to start from the inside? You? Yeah, 100%. Were they? 100%. Or from gate one? Uh, I reckon. It's not frustrating, or it is a little bit, but it's almost like you, you just want more for him as well, as well as the team. Like, we know it can be achieved, and we've seen it last year, we've seen glimpses of it, you know, like a, like a fourth year and a fifth there, and it was consistent. And when you go back and actually look at last year, it was actually a really solid year for one moto of each GP. It was good. You're ready to go, mate. There's nothing you can't do. But you know what it's like. You know what it can get like. Just got to get a good start and go for it. You're faster than any of them. You're fitter than all of them. You just got to go. Be sensible in the race. Get the points. Top six, fine. Two top six. Dude. If the opportunity is there to get two top threes, take it. If the opportunity is there for the win, go for it. You know, you'll be good. You can do it. Uh, three top six is a real good start. Yeah. You can light it up here if you want. Mm -hmm. If you get the start, just uh, just go for it. Honestly, everyone else will be. Hey. Everyone else is not in any better position than you are. You know? Yeah. You'll be good. All the training. Let's do it. Gate about to drop here, and that's a good jump from the Yamaha's uh, again. That's it, Renault. Well, it's going to be a big moment for it, isn't it? Windy overall here. And Maxime Maxime Renault wins the British GP, his first victory of the season and second of his career. Conrad Muse crosses the line in 17th overall, not what the British fans would have expected from such a promising talent. But before Matterley, he was he was geared up for it. You know, there was no reason for us not to believe he wasn't ready for it, and it just didn't happen on the day. It was it was one of those, you know, and he quite openly say that he's not. He's not blamed the bike with anything. He's happy with the bike, he's happy with the suspension. It's just um, a few months just to get this rolling and get the results coming out.
there are many riders through the years who have had the speed and the ability to do the job, but their mind just lets them down. It's the same in any walk of life or any sport. Sometimes finding that mental edge can be the difference between struggling to reach your potential or maximizing it. That's why some riders bring in trainers who have been there, done that, and maybe even gone through similar problems. Think of Mark Deruva, who took Paul Jonas to his first world title in 2017. He now works with the FNH Racing Kawasaki team, and namely Rowan van der Moestijk, and he's trying to help him do the same thing, reach that next level and fulfill his potential that is so clear for everyone to see. Okay, my name is Mark de Reuver. Uh, I'm working for FNH Kawasaki Racing, and my job is trainer, mental coach, um, shoulder to cry on, uh, and the babysitter. Zie, hier, hier moet je al rechtop gaan zitten. Hier, kijk, rechtop zitten. Niet vooruit, rechtop moet je. Je moet hem voelen. Zo, je moet hem voelen. Nou, ik kan zeggen dat de training op de track, wat ik doe met hem, is 40% important and I say 60% of the mental side. It's a lot. It's much more because I know he can ride really well. You know, of course, you can always be better and I see elf every time I see things. But it's more the mental side you need to work on. And um, that showed also because like that last motor in Lommel, that was the only race I really saw my row on, let's say. The last, that last moto in uh, in Lommel, he was so good, he was completely relaxed, he was good, you know. Great ride this from the FNH Kawasaki, haven't seen too much of him, but he is also on the verge of making his own little piece of history. Rowan van der Moestijk, the FNH Kawasaki rider, finally wins a race in MX2. Still in the last few weeks, I'm, I'm, I'm three years now with Mark, and still in the last few weeks I still learn uh, from him, he always has new things, and and then when in the night I lay in my bed, I don't, I think, yeah, how is this possible? Um, I thought like this year, hmm, what what does he, what can he say about uh, uh, about me? Because he knows me for for three years, you know, and still he comes with new things, and that's what makes him so special. See what you do? Heel de brommel, zoals je gaat, op zo met die kop eroverheen. Dan kijk maar naar je kont, hij moet naar je kont kijken, kijk, die gaat omhoog. Ja. Zie je, en dan, en dan zo, maar dat is, dan is die ding, want hier is wel goed hoor, dit. Ja. Zie je, maar dan ben je te laat, hè? Zie je dat? Ja. Zie je hier nog steeds zo, helemaal naar voren. Ja. Dan moet je al achterop zitten. When he finished his career and he started to approach the career of a trainer, of uh, preparing other riders, uh, I was thinking, with all the mistakes he did, probably he knew really well what not to do, but would be able to teach them what to do. Super, boy. That's a good start, hoor. He needs to know that um, what he's capable of, you know? And sometimes I think he forgets that or he's, I don't know what's in his head, you know? I try to... Uh, to reveal that also a little bit, but um, he needs to be more sure of himself, and he knows that. And when he's sure of himself, you get a repeat of that European Championship here, and that last moto in Lommel. Of course, you cannot be always first, eh, because you have pile-ups in the start or something happens, but that's motocross. But he needs to start believing in himself at before the start already. It's important. Yeah, of course, uh, home GP is always uh, a bit different. Um, I want to do good here. Uh, the crowd is amazing. It's nice to be back with them. And um, yeah, I want to give them something back. And uh, I've been quite consistent uh, the first few rounds and um, I want to be on the box. I always had it a little bit, also when I was younger. Um, I became a few times Dutch champion and still thought that some guys were better than me. So I think it's also a little bit of myself um, but yeah also when Mar when Mark uh, say to me how good I am uh, or many other people um, yeah there's still a little bit of, of yeah thought that 
hmm, maybe someone is better, and that needs to be uh, out and uh, yeah. Next two, race one, 30 minutes plus two laps, about to get underway here. Who will it be that grabs that all important Fox hole shot? The five second quarter's turn. Brace yourselves. From the middle of the box, the gates came yesterday in the European Championship races and already swinging wide and maybe wider than they needed to be. One or two riders. And again there on the exit, Van der Mostijk sensing an opportunity here to sneak up the inside, parks it down the inside beautifully. Van der Mostijk now in the third place. And Van der Mostijk Good, through that long sweeper and into the face of the jump because he got alongside Rennie Hoffer and has easily taken second position. Well, the problem is in my whole, you know, my whole life, until today, I cannot lose. I hate losing. That has been the... Uh, I think it, uh, we say it in Holland, the red line in my career. For the final time. Oh, a couple of itchy trigger fingers there. So Kids leads the Wolf second, Peter third, Guadagnini fourth, Fernandez, Renault, Hoffer. Fans on their feet. Oh, around about the most like disappointment for the FNH Kawasaki rider. Can't believe it. The bike has let go on him, it appears. Judging from the body language there. Yeah, I know what I can do. I, I proved it a few times last year. Uh, I know I can win. I showed it, um, but I just want to be more consistent and fight more for the podiums. And I think when you can do that, you will be up front in the, in the championship standing. So that's my goal and uh, of course to be a world champion. But in the end, the cool, decisive riding of Jago Kitt, one out. He wins here in Oz, he wins both races, a huge victory for the Monster Energy Yamaha rider. The feeling that the guys give me when they're on the podium, I also cry many times because it's my, it's my passion, it's what I do, when I, I live for this, you know? I live for winning. And the feeling you get when you win, it doesn't matter what people say, it's impossible you can give that, get that with money. It's not possible, that feeling. So I want to push that also on everybody's heart, go for it, you know? And, and try the best you can and never give up. It's, nothing is going to be the feeling ever after your motorsport career. The CP International, presented by Rolex, returned to Calgary this weekend at the CSIO Spruce Meadows Masters for the third of the four equestrian majors in 2022. It doesn't matter how many times you've done it before or what you did the week, the months or the year before. The courses are always completely different, so it's probably an advantage to know what to expect, but still it's very different every year. This year you can see in the field the CP International presented by Rolex is the best of the best. What's really unique is that when there's 40 entries, there's almost 40 people that can win it. So it's anybody's game on Sunday. It's the toughest round of show jumping that I've ever jumped in my life. You need a horse that is going to have a lot of stamina, that's going to jump the first round easy enough. 
If you've asked too much effort and you've gone clear, you're not going to make it the second round. You got to try to give it as much confidence in the first round that it comes back for a battle. The first two rounds of the CP International presented by Rolex proved very difficult indeed on Sunday, with only three pairings qualifying for the jump off. First out was Rolex testimony and defending champion Steve Gerda on Venard de Cerisi, who, despite delivering the fastest time, could not reproduce the precision of his earlier rounds. And after Gilles Thomas finished on eight faults, it was up to Rolex testimony Daniel Deusser to delight the crowd. A third clear round in a time of 45.78 aboard Killer Queen VDM. The German has now won three majors in the last 12 months. I needed a couple of seconds to realize what actually happened, but uh, no, then I was really, really proud. Being part of that Rolex can slam here again and winning one of the majors is, a, is an unbelievable feeling and I'm very, very proud of that. The Rolex Grand Slam of show jumping returns in December for the CHI Geneva. September 20th, 1519. Ferdinand Magellan sets out from Spain on a voyage to find a western passage to the Spice Islands in Indonesia. The Portuguese explorer is killed in the Philippines, but one of his ships eventually becomes the first to circle the world. 1958. In New York City, a brush with death for the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. The civil rights leader is seriously wounded when an apparently deranged woman stabs him during an appearance at a department store. King recovers from the attack. 2005. Simon Wiesenthal, the Holocaust survivor who pursued fugitive Nazis for decades after World War II, dies in Vienna, Austria. He was 96 years old. 1934. You have been through this a hundred times. I need to know. Where do you find your courage? Sophia Loren, the Italian movie actress who became a global sex symbol, is born in Rome. And 1973, what's billed as the Battle of the Sexes takes place at the Houston Astrodome. That's where tennis star Billie Jean King defeats Bobby Riggs in straight sets. Also that same year, singer and songwriter Jim Croce dies in a plane crash near Nakatosh, Louisiana. He was 30 years old. Today in history, September 20th, Ed Donahue, The Associated Press. Welcome back in our studio and in today's news, 